Book Seventeen, Chapters Five through Eight of the City of God. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darren L. Slider, www.logoslibrary.org. The City of God by Saint Augustine of Hippo, Book Seventeen, Chapter Five. But this is said more plainly by a man of God sent to Eli the priest himself, whose name indeed is not mentioned, but whose office and ministry show him to have been indubitably a prophet. For it is thus written, And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said, Thus saith the Lord, I plainly revealed myself unto thy father's house, when they were in the land of Egypt, slaves in Pharaoh's house. And I chose thy father's house, out of all the scepters of Israel, to fill the office of priest for me, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, and wear the ephod. And I gave thy father's house for food all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel. Wherefore, then, hast thou looked at mine incense, and at mine offerings with an impudent eye, and hast glorified thy sons above me, to bless the firstfruits of every sacrifice in Israel before me? Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I said, Thy house and thy father's house should walk before me for ever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me. For them that honour me will I honour, and he that despiseth me shall be despised. Behold, the days come, that I will cut off thy seed, and the seed of thy father's house, and thou shalt never have an old man in my house. And I will cut off the man of thine from mine altar, so that his eyes shall be consumed, and his heart shall melt away, and every one of thy house that is left shall fall by the sword of men. And this shall be a sign unto thee, that shall come upon these thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest, that shall do according to all that is in mine heart, and in my soul. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my Christ for ever. And it shall come to pass, that he who is left in thine house shall come to worship him with a piece of money, saying, Put me into one part of thy priesthood, that I may eat bread. We cannot say that this prophecy, in which the change of the ancient priesthood is foretold with so great plainness, was fulfilled in Samuel. For although Samuel was not of another tribe than that which had been appointed by God to serve at the altar, yet he was not of the sons of Aaron, whose offspring was set apart that the priests might be taken out of it. And thus by that transaction also the same change which had come to pass through Christ Jesus is shadowed forth, and the prophecy itself, indeed, not in word, belonged to the Old Testament properly, but figuratively to the New, signifying by the fact just what was said by the word to Eli the priest through the prophet. For there were afterwards priests of Aaron's race, such as Zadok and Abiathar during David's reign, and others in succession, before the time came when those things which were predicted so long before about the changing of the priesthood behooved to be fulfilled by Christ. But who that now views these things with a believing eye does not see that they are fulfilled? Since indeed no tabernacle, no temple, no altar, no sacrifice, and therefore no priest either has remained to the Jews, to whom it was commanded in the law of God that he should be ordained to the seed of Aaron, which is also mentioned here by the prophet when he says, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I said, Thy house and thy father's house shall walk before me for ever, but now the Lord saith, That be far from me. For them that honour me will I honour, and he that despiseth me shall be despised. For that in naming his father's house he does not mean that of his immediate father, but that of Aaron, who was first appointed to be priest, to be succeeded by others descended from him, is shown by the preceding words when he says, I was revealed unto thy father's house, when they were in the land of Egypt, slaves in Pharaoh's house, and I chose thy father's house out of all the scepters of Israel to fill the office of priest for me. Which of the fathers in that Egyptian slavery but Aaron was his father, who, when they were set free, was chosen to the priesthood? It was of his lineage, therefore, he has said in this passage, it should come to pass, that they should no longer be priests, which already we see fulfilled. If faith be watchful, the things are before us, they are discerned, they are grasped, and are forced on the eyes of the unwilling, so that they are seen. 
Behold, the days come, he says, that I will cut off thy seed and the seed of thy father's house, and thou shalt never have an old man in mine house. And I will cut off the man of thine from mine altar, so that his eyes shall be consumed, and his heart shall melt away. Behold, the days which were foretold have already come. There is no priest after the order of Aaron, and whoever is a man of his lineage, when he sees the sacrifice of the Christians prevailing over the whole world, but that great honor taken away from himself, his eyes fail, and his soul melts away, consumed with grief. But what follows belongs properly to the house of Eli, to whom these things were said. And every one of thine house that is left shall fall by the sword of men. And this shall be a sign unto thee, that shall come upon these thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. This, therefore, is made a sign of the change of the priesthood from this man's house, by which it is signified that the priesthood of Aaron's house is to be changed. For the death of this man's son signified the death not of the men, but of the priesthood itself of the sons of Aaron. But what follows pertains to that priest whom Samuel typified by succeeding this one. Therefore the things which follow are said of Christ Jesus, the true priest of the New Testament. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to all that is in mine heart and in my soul, and I will build him a sure house. The same is the eternal Jerusalem above. And he shall walk, saith he, before my Christ always. He shall walk means he shall be conversant with, just as he had said before of Aaron's house, I said that thine house and thy father's house shall walk before me for ever. But what he says, he shall walk before my Christ, is to be understood entirely of the house itself, not of the priest, who is Christ himself, the mediator and saviour. His house, therefore, shall walk before him. Shall walk may also be understood to mean from death to life, all the time this mortality passes through, even to the end of this world. But where God says, Who will do all that is in mine heart and in my soul, we must not think that God has a soul, for he is the author of souls. But this is said of God tropically, not properly, just as he is said to have hands and feet and other corporal members. And, lest it should be supposed from such language that man in the form of this flesh is made in the image of God, wings also are ascribed to him, which man has not at all. And it is said to God, Hide me under the shadow of thy wings, that men may understand that such things are said of that ineffable nature, not in proper, but in figurative words. But what is added, and it shall come to pass, that he who is left in thine house shall come to worship him, is not said properly of the house of this Eli, but of that Aaron, the men of which remained even to the advent of Jesus Christ, of which race there are not wanting men even to this present. For of that house of Eli it had already been said above, And every one of thine house that is left shall fall by the sword of men. How, therefore, could it be truly said here, and it shall come to pass that every one that is left shall come to worship him, if that is true, that no one shall escape the avenging sword, unless he would have it understood of those who belong to the race of that whole priesthood after the order of Aaron? Therefore, if it is of these the predestinated remnant, about whom another prophet has said, The remnant shall be saved, whence the apostle also says, Even so, then, at this time also the remnant according to the election of grace is saved, since it is easily understood to be of such a remnant that it is said, He that is left in thine house, assuredly he believes in Christ, just as in the time of the apostle very many of that nation believed. Nor are there now wanting those, although very few, who yet believe, and in them is fulfilled what this man of God has here immediately added, he shall come to worship him with a piece of money. To worship whom, if not that chief priest who is also God? For in that priesthood, after the order of Aaron, men did not come to the temple or altar of God for the purpose of worshipping the priest. But what is that he says, was a piece of money, if not the short word of faith, about which the apostle quotes the saying, A consummating and shortening word will the Lord make upon the earth. But that money is put for the word the psalm is a witness, where it is sung, The words of the Lord are pure words, money tried with the fire. What then does he say who comes to worship the priest of God, even the priest who is God? 
put me into one part of thy priesthood to eat bread. I do not wish to be set in the honour of my fathers, which is none. Put me in a part of thy priesthood, for I have chosen to be mean in thine house. I desire to be a member, no matter what or how small, of thy priesthood. By the priesthood he here means the people itself, of which he is the priest who is the mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. This people the apostle Peter calls a holy people, a royal priesthood. But some have translated of thy sacrifice, not of thy priesthood, which no less signifies the same Christian people. Whence the apostle Paul says, We being many are one bread, one body. And again he says, Present your bodies a living sacrifice. What therefore he has added to eat bread also elegantly expresses the very kind of sacrifice of which the priest himself says, The bread which I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The same is the sacrifice not after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. Let him that readeth understand. Therefore this short and salutarily humble confession, in which it is said, Put me in a part of thy priesthood to eat bread, is itself the piece of money, for it is both brief, and it is the word of God who dwells in the heart of one who believes. For because he had said above that he had given for food to Aaron's house the sacrificial victims of the Old Testament, where he says, I have given thy father's house for food all things which are offered by fire of the children of Israel, which indeed were the sacrifices of the Jews, therefore here he has said, to eat bread, which is in the New Testament the sacrifice of the Christians. Chapter 6 while, therefore, these things now shine forth as clearly as they were loftily foretold, still some one may not vainly be moved to ask, How can we be confident that all things are to come to pass which are predicted in these books as about to come, if this very thing which is there divinely spoken, Thine house and thy father's house shall walk before me for ever, could not have effect? For we see that the priesthood has been changed, and there can be no hope that what was promised to that house may some time be fulfilled, because that which succeeds on its being rejected and changed is rather predicted as eternal. He who says this does not yet understand, or does not recollect, that this very priesthood after the order of Aaron was appointed as the shadow of a future eternal priesthood, and therefore when eternity is promised to it, it is not promised to the mere shadow and figure, but to what is shadowed forth and prefigured by it. But lest it should be thought the shadow itself was to remain, therefore its mutation also behooved to be foretold. In this way, too, the kingdom of Saul himself, who certainly was reprobated and rejected, was the shadow of a kingdom yet to come, which should remain to eternity. For indeed the oil with which he was anointed, and from that chrism he is called Christ, is to be taken in a mystical sense, and is to be understood as a great mystery, which David himself venerated so much in him, that he trembled with smitten heart, when, being hid in a dark cave, which Saul also entered when pressed by the necessity of nature, he had come secretly behind him, and cut off a small piece of his robe, that he might be able to prove how he had spared him when he could have killed him, and might thus Thus remove from his mind the suspicion through which he had vehemently persecuted the holy David, thinking him his enemy. Therefore he was much afraid lest he should be accused of violating so great a mystery in Saul, because he had thus meddled even his clothes. For thus it is written, and David's heart smote him because he had taken away the skirt of his cloak. But to the men with him, who advised him to destroy Saul, thus delivered up into his hands, he saith, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's Christ, to lay my hand upon him, because he is the Lord's Christ. Therefore he showed so great reverence to this shadow of what was to come, not for its own sake, but for the sake of what it prefigured. Whence also that which Samuel says to Saul, since thou hast not kept my commandment which the Lord commanded thee, whereas now the Lord would have prepared thy kingdom over Israel for ever, yet now thy kingdom shall not continue for thee, and the Lord will seek him a man after his own heart, and the Lord will command him to be prince over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee, is not to be taken as if God had settled that Saul himself should reign for ever, and afterwards, on his sinning, would not keep this promise, nor was he 
ignorant that he would sin, but he had established his kingdom that it might be a figure of the eternal kingdom. Therefore he added, Yet now thy kingdom shall not continue for thee. Therefore what it signified has stood and shall stand, but it shall not stand for this man, because he himself was not to reign for ever, nor his offspring, so that at least that word for ever might seem to be fulfilled through his posterity one to another. And the Lord, he saith, will seek him a man, meaning either David or the mediator of the New Testament, who is figured in the chrism with which David also and his offspring was anointed. But it is not as if he knew not where he was, that God thus seeks him a man, but, speaking through a man, he speaks as a man, and in this sense seeks us. For not only to God the Father, but also to his only begotten, who came to seek what was lost, we had been known already even so far as to be chosen in him before the foundation of the world. He will seek him, therefore means, he will have his own, just as if he had said, whom he already has known to be his own, he will show to others to be his friend. Whence in Latin this word, querit, receives a preposition, and becomes acquirit, acquires, the meaning of which is plain enough. Although even without the addition of the preposition, querere is understood as acquirere, whence gains are called questus. CHAPTER seven. Again Saul sinned through disobedience, and again Samuel says to him in the word of the Lord, Because thou hast despised the word of the Lord, the Lord hath despised thee, that thou mayest not be king over Israel. And again for the same sin, when Saul confessed it, and prayed for pardon, and besought Samuel to return with him to appease the Lord, he said, I will not return with thee, for thou hast despised the word of the Lord, and the Lord will despise thee, that thou mayest not be king over Israel. And Samuel turned his face to go away, and Saul laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and rent it. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom from Israel out of thine hand this day, and will give it to thy neighbor, who is good above thee, and will divide Israel in twain. And he will not be changed, neither will he repent, for he is not as a man that he should repent, who threatens and does not persist. He to whom it is said, The Lord will despise thee, that thou mayest not be king over Israel, and the Lord hath rent the kingdom from Israel out of thine hand this day, reigned forty years over Israel, that is, just as long a time as David himself, he had heard this in the first period of his reign, that we may understand it was said, because none of his race was to reign, and that we may look to the race of David, whence also is sprung, according to the flesh, the mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. But the scripture has not what is read in most Latin copies, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel out of thine hand this day. But just as we have set it down, it is found in the Greek copies, The Lord hath rent the kingdom from Israel out of thine hand, that the words out of thine hand may be understood to mean from Israel. Therefore this man figuratively represented the people of Israel, which was to lose the kingdom, Christ Jesus our Lord being about to reign, not carnally, but spiritually. And when it is said of him, And will give it to thy neighbor, that is to be referred to the fleshly kinship, for Christ, according to the flesh, was of Israel, whence also Saul sprang. But what is added, Good above thee, may indeed be understood better than thee, and indeed some have thus translated it. But it is better taken thus, Good above thee, as meaning that, because he is good, therefore he must be above thee, according to that other prophetic saying, Till I put all thine enemies under thy feet. And among them is Israel, from whom, as his persecutor, Christ took away the kingdom, although the Israel in whom there was no guile may have been there too, a sort of grain, as it were, of that chaff. For certainly thence came the apostles, thence so many martyrs, of whom Stephen is the first, thence so many churches which the apostle Paul names, magnifying God in their conversion. Of which thing I do not doubt what follows is to be understood, and will divide Israel in twain, to wit, into Israel pertaining to the bondwoman, and Israel pertaining to the free. For these two kinds were at first together, as Abraham still clave to the bondwoman, until the barren, made fruitful by the grace of God, cried, Cast out the bondwoman and her son. 
we know indeed that on account of the sin of Solomon, in the reign of his son Rehoboam, Israel was divided in two, and continued so, the separate parts having their own kings, until that whole nation was overthrown with a great destruction, and carried away by the Chaldeans. But what was this to Saul, when, if any such thing was threatened, it would be threatened against David himself, whose son Solomon was? Finally, the Hebrew nation is not now divided internally, but is dispersed through the earth indiscriminately in the fellowship of the same error. But that division with which God threatened the kingdom and people in the person of Saul who represented them is shown to be eternal and unchangeable by this which is added, and he will not be changed, neither will he repent, for he is not as a man that he should repent, who threatens and does not persist. That is, a man threatens and does not persist, but not God, who does not repent like man. For when we read that he repents, a change of circumstance is meant, flowing from the divine immutable foreknowledge. Therefore, when God is said not to repent, it is to be understood that he does not change. We see that this sentence concerning this division of the people of Israel, divinely uttered in these words, has been altogether irremediable and quite perpetual. For whoever have turned, or are turning, or shall turn thence to Christ, it has been according to the foreknowledge of God, not according to the one and the same nature of the human race. Certainly none of the Israelites who, cleaving to Christ, have continued in him, shall ever be among those Israelites who persist in being his enemies even to the end of this life, but shall forever remain in the separation which is here foretold. For the Old Testament from the Mount Sinai which gendereth the bondage profiteth nothing unless because it bears witness to the New Testament. Otherwise, however long Moses is read, the veil is put over their heart. But when any one shall turn thence to Christ, the veil shall be taken away. For the very desire of those who turn is changed from the old to the new, so that each no longer desires to obtain carnal but spiritual felicity. Wherefore that great prophet Samuel himself, before he had anointed Saul, when he had cried to the Lord for Israel, and he had heard him, and when he had offered a whole burnt offering, as the aliens were coming to battle against the people of God, and the Lord thundered above them, and they were confused, and fell before Israel, and were overcome, then he took one stone, and set it up between the old and new Masiphat, Mizpah, and called its name Ebenezer, which means the stone of the helper, and said, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Masiphat is interpreted desire. That stone of the helper is the mediation of the Saviour, by which we go from the old Masiphat to the new, that is, from the desire with which carnal happiness was expected in the carnal kingdom, to the desire with which the truest spiritual happiness is expected in the kingdom of heaven. And since nothing is better than that, the Lord helpeth us hitherto. Chapter 8 and now I see I must show what pertaining to the matter I treat of God promised to David himself, who succeeded Saul in the kingdom, whose change prefigured that final change on account of which all things were divinely spoken, all things were committed to writing. When many things had gone prosperously with King David, he thought to make a house for God, even that temple of most excellent renown which was afterwards built by King Solomon his son. While he was thinking of this, the word of the Lord came to Nathan the prophet, which he brought to the king, in which, after God had said that a house should not be built unto him by David himself, and that in all that long time he had never commanded any of his people to build him a house of cedar, he says, And now thus shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith God Almighty, I took thee from the sheepcote that thou mightest be for a ruler over my people in Israel, and I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies from before thy face, and have made thee a name according to the name of the great ones who were over the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant him, and he shall dwell apart, and shall be troubled no more, and the son of wickedness shall not humble him any more, as from the beginning, from the days when I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give thee rest from all thine enemies, and the Lord will tell, hath told, thee, because thou shalt build an house for him. And it shall come to pass, when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will prepare his kingdom. 
he shall build me an house for my name, and I will order his throne even to eternity. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the sons of men. But my mercy I will not take away from him, as I took it away from those whom I put away from before my face. And his house shall be faithful, and his kingdom even for evermore before me, and his throne shall be set up even for evermore. He who thinks this grand promise was fulfilled in Solomon greatly errs, for he attends to the saying, He shall build me an house, but he does not attend to the saying, His house shall be faithful, and his kingdom for evermore before me. Let him therefore attend, and behold the house of Solomon full of strange women worshipping false gods, and the king himself, aforetime wise, seduced by them, and cast down into the same idolatry. And let him not dare to think that God either promised this falsely, or was unable to foreknow that Solomon and his house would become what they did. But we ought not to be in doubt here, or to see the fulfillment of these things, save in Christ our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, lest we should vainly and uselessly look for some other here, like the carnal Jews. For even they understand this much, that the son whom they read of in that place as promised to David was not Solomon, so that with wonderful blindness to him who was promised and is now declared with so great manifestation, they say they hope for another. Indeed, even in Solomon there appeared some image of the future event, in that he built the temple and had peace according to his name, for Solomon means pacific, and in the beginning of his reign was wonderfully praiseworthy. But while, as a shadow of him that should come, he foreshadowed Christ our Lord, he did not also in his own person resemble him. Whence some things concerning him are so written as if they were prophesied of himself, while the Holy Scripture, prophesying even by events, somehow delineates in him the figure of things to come. For besides the books of divine history in which his reign is narrated, the seventy-second psalm also is inscribed in the title with his name, in which so many things are said which cannot at all apply to him, but which apply to the Lord Christ with such evident fitness as makes it quite apparent that in the one the figure is in some way shadowed forth, but in the other the truth itself is presented. For it is known within what bounds the kingdom of Solomon was enclosed, and yet in that psalm, not to speak of other things, we read, He shall have dominion even from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth, which we see fulfilled in Christ. Truly he took the beginning of his reigning from the river where John baptized, for when pointed out by him, he began to be acknowledged by the disciples, who called him not only Master, but also Lord. Nor was it for any other reason that while his father David was still living, Solomon began to reign, which happened to none other of their kings, except that from this also it might be clearly apparent that it was not himself this prophecy spoken to his father signified beforehand, saying, And it shall come to pass, when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will prepare his kingdom." How, therefore, shall it be thought on account of what follows, he shall build me in house, that this Solomon is prophesied, and not rather be understood on account of what proceeds, when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will raise up thy seed after thee, that another pacific one is promised, who is foretold as about to be raised up, not before David's death, as he was, but after it. For however long the interval of time might be before Jesus Christ came, beyond doubt it was after the death of King David, to whom he was so promised that he behooved to come, who should build an house of God, not of wood and stone, but of men, such as we rejoice he does build. For to this house, that is, to believers, the apostle saith, The temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. End of Book 17, Chapters 5-8 through 8. Recording by Darren L. Slider, Fort Worth, Texas, www.logoslibrary.org.